Uh, also, before I get started, I always want to thank, and I always leave people out, but I want I want to thank Melanie. This is her very first time being service associate, and she's doing a great job. <laughs> and Daryl, every week, I mean, we can do it. And Victoria for ta talking to us about the plate. And Andrew, always your music, and um, Martha and the choir, and Meadows, thank you for the song. We thank her for the story. And we just couldn't do these things without, so let's give her a And I wanted to introduce um, you know, I don't have to introduce her, you know her. Uh, Amy Phillips, would you like to? Amy actually bid on the sermon at the auction. You know, you get to, to bid on a sermon. So she was the sermon um, award-winning bidder this year. That gave her a chance to tell me what she wanted to have spoken about. She also was very involved in picking some of the hymns and picking out uh, the opening words came from her preference and the closing words. So she really took advantage and really helped me to put together this service. So I really appreciate it. So I asked her... What is the takeaway that people are supposed to take away at the end of this uh, service, which is always very challenging to me since sometimes that isn't complete until Sunday morning. But um, what work can AUF do that affirms our new mission? Because without works, it's just words. And she said, I might have had it wrong. I might, it might be that the sermon asks the question versus giving answers. And yeah, <laughs> pretty much. But I just think, let's give her an applause. Yeah. And the auction is coming up, and I'm sure that there will be a sermon to be auctioned off again. So I'm looking forward to working with someone else. It'll be lots of fun. So I've always been a you, you. Well, that's technically speaking not true because I'm old enough to not have had the merger yet. So who's really smarty pants today and can tell us when the merger was between the Unitarian What? 1961. 61, 62, I think. But anyway, I'm older than that, and I was taken to um, UU congregations when I was very, I think you might be well. Like, I have always been a UU, and then us have always been taught and coached to be spiritually curious, restless, doubting, believing, searching, growing, and trusting most of the time on my own soul's journey. I grew up in UU religious education, listening and reading and learning about an assortment of religious practices and worldviews, touching and tasting them in cathedrals and temples and meeting halls. When we used to have a, um, a class called Church Across the Street, now we call it Neighboring Faith. So at a very young age, because that's all there were, I visited other churches. As we got more expansive, and I began to teach that class, by the way, <laughs> then we had the whole range of religious communities to visit. Then there was God and Jesus and Moses and Krishna and Buddha. All were names and stories that were familiar to me from a very young age. At whatever stage I was in my own intellectual and moral and spiritual development, they were all there for me, these spiritual guides for my quest to live a good life because that's what I was taught we were here to do. Take everything else away. Unitarian universes are here to live a good life and be good to people around us and to act in the world around them. It was as natural as breathing for me to take in all this curious richness, to distill it, to digest it, to work it in and around and sometimes out of my system. After all, I was a you, you, alive to ideas and compelled to understand. So a good and immodestly maybe even righteous, <coughs> righteous you, you, I grew into a social activist and journalist on a mission of prophecy and reform. First, I worked on this in the arts and culture, then the reproductive <coughs> rights movement, and then in the area of child and family policy. But after 20 years or so, I was tired. I was tapped out. I was a warrior woman, cynical and empty. I found myself railing against a society that wouldn't work the way that I thought it should. How many of you can raise your hand and tell us that you've done that? Okay. A narcissistic worldview that left me angry and lonely and ineffective and wretched. I was doing in the world. But why and what was I doing it for? Well, I wasn't alone. There were a lot of people around me, very busy acting. But where were we collectively coming from? 
Where was our common vision and commitment? As Marion Wright Edelman has asked, you know, she's the head of children, children's, um, what was it? children's defense fund. My God, I love her, and I all of a sudden forgot her name. Anyway, Marion Wright Edelman said, or asked, what does God command of us in terms of our treatment of the children and the poor? What does it mean in terms of how we relate to our children and how we speak to our children? Where is our religious and moral base for building a just society? After a few years of wrestling with this question, I discovered that the center, that the place I come from and the place I can go out of is my you, you, faith. And I can tell you how unashamedly that this is where I witness from on the injustices in the world. And this liberal faith in church home is the source of my mission. It always has been. I just didn't pay attention. That's why in the spirit of trying to understand what my mission was, that I unhesitatingly enrolled in a course called The Mission of the Church in a Pluralistic Society, my very first semester at Candler School of Theology, Emory University, which was overwhelmingly populated with Methodist and Baptist and other Protestant students. Trust me, I wasn't even thinking it would be a bizarre beginning for my seminary studies. I was immediately buried in terminology that, believe me, as a Unitarian Universalist, I had never heard of and hadn't a clue about. Maybe you did from growing up, maybe some of you in Protestant denominations. The Great Commission, the Great Awakening, Mission Field, Syncretism, you get the picture. And then my fellow students, two Methodist missionaries, one Church of the Nazarene, one Southern Baptist, and one unaffiliated Evangelical Nine, were all told to describe our backgrounds and our perceptions and visions for church mission. And then I knew I wasn't in Kansas anymore. <laughs> when asked to share mission memories, one colleague's earliest recollection of world mission was of slideshows of foreign countries by visiting missionaries, which always concluded by singing the song, People Need the Lord. Another said that from his early youth, he had been told that there were people in the world who didn't go to churches like his, and he decided that anyone who didn't attend a Christian church must have been a savage hiding in the bushes waiting to shrink some heads. The unattached evangelical said that for him in 1976, mission was a place he used to go. You see, he was in the Navy and poor, and he could go mission in Chicago have a bunk to sleep in and breakfast. Then he could save his money for entertainment and bar bills. And now he is saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. It would be so easy, and it was so easy for me, a more enlightened UU, to float over the top of that group, knowing that we UUs never think that we are people that have something that other people need spiritually. And that we you use don't need Jesus or Buddha or Mayor Baba or any religious tag to justify our good works. In fact, our being involved in you you doesn't have anything really to do with our actual deeds in the world at all. We don't do mission. End of question. End of discussion. But is that true? For me, for you, for the you you prophets and pioneers we sing about from our hymnal. For those heroes and sheroes of our faith, was their work beyond their church walls really disconnected from what drew them originally to the UU faith? Or were they witnessing, sometimes quite specifically, to the connection between their liberal faith and their passion for justice and service? So were they not in mission to the wider world? I was eight years old when I first heard the word mission. My family had gone to California for a year while my father did a postdoctoral fellowship in Berkeley. My parents wanted to spend weekends and vacations touring the state top to bottom, and one way of marking off the journey was to visit the line of Jesuit missions built by Father Junipero Serra, north from Santa Rosa, south to San Diego. Map and guidebook in hand, we set off to see Mission San Rafael, which was the closest one, which I remember as an impressive adobe structure. The chapel and priest's quarters were cool in that hot, 
pre-air conditioned afternoons of the 1950s. The sanctuary had rows of burning candles and high ceilings, especially to a child, spooky silent archways. Best of all, there was a souvenir shop where I could buy a little ceramic model of a mission, or maybe a postcard or a plastic statue of the canonized Father Sarah. So my first impression was a benign but religiously vague one of an historic landmark connected somehow with the civilizing beginnings of the state of California, not with spiritual conversion. However, being who I was in the UU family I grew up in, it was less than 15 minutes before my mother showed me another part of the mission. She insistently pointed out a dusty, grassless cemetery where the Catholics had buried the unnamed Indian children who were living at the mission. My mother told me that the missionaries made these children wear white people's clothing and learn the Christian Bible, that they died of diseases the Spanish missionaries had carried over from Europe. Thus, my second memory is of sadness and anger. I had already visited Indian villages and pueblos. I had watched their ritual dances. I found old arrowheads with the Native children. I collected Native American dolls. I thought myself the kin of Sacagawea. The Girl Guide for Explorers, Lewis and Clark, I loved Indian life. What, what had been so bad that little Indian children had to change or die? I carried this experience into my late grammar school California history lessons, where we looked up Father Sarah and missions in the World Book Encyclopedia and dutifully reported that the missions, quote, fed, clothed, housed, and protected the Indians who lived there in exchange for instruction in Christianity and Spanish language lessons and work on the mission grounds. But the story was sketchy. It was for later school children to learn that the native people were largely responsible for the success of agricultural and manufacturing centers that built up around the missions, and that once these people came to the mission, they were not allowed to leave except by force. So basically, when I think on it, my experience of mission as a younger person was only on the shadow side, the height of colonialism side, the counting little baptized soul side, the side that only helped in order to save. How many of you come in with that kind of understanding? Many of our church members left their original faith tradition because of this inhumane and sometimes murderous tradition of mission and evangelizing work. They may even now cringe. You may even now cringe at the word mission and may oppose any discussion at all of spreading our faith through community outreach or linking what we do out in the world with you, you as religious base using the word mission using the word mission as a way of living into the world, living our faith into the world. But the truth is, the truth is that you, you, now get ready to hear this, are you ready? Has always been an evangelizing religion and church in mission from both denominational ends of our history. Scott Alexander, who used to be the senior minister of the Church of the Larger Fellowship and a third generation UU, says that the world is desperate for our theology, desperate for a theology centered on tolerance and independence and compassion. It is not the only saving message out there. But our underlying belief, our underlying faith in the inherent worth and dignity of each person and the interdependent web of all existence creates a powerful theology. The Reverend Carl Seberg, a UU historian, says that UU began as a saving evangelical religion, saving people from Calvinism. That was our big mission, saving people from eternal sin. <laughs> In the 19th century, universals such as Hosea, Balu, and Quilin Shin literally rode the circuit all over the country and beyond. Shin was constantly traveling and preaching and organizing congregations saying, quote, the grandest recreation I get is working to spread our faith. Every liberal thinker in this region is my parishioner. I own these mountains. I cannot more keep missionary work out, out of a pleasant excursion than I can keep universalism out of my sermons. 
That's pretty evangelical. These universalist missionaries, including Carol and Sule, fanned out across the new nation in Europe, challenging the Calvinist idea that most humans are doomed to hell, preaching instead that salvation was available to all and that love and compassion was necessary towards all. Dr. Rees William was the president of the still extant Evangelical Missionary Society in Massachusetts formed in 1807 to aid the spread of Unitarianism through the distribution of religious tracts and books by supporting school teachers and sending missionaries, UU or Unitarian missionaries, among the inhabitants of our own country. He spent a lot of his time with the Navajos and the Hopi. UU Evangelical Missionary Society. Still like and of course, we are replete with examples of lay ministry work. Clara Barton, abolitionist Mary A. Livermore, Albert Schweitzer in Africa, those UUs who helped get Jewish children out of Europe during World War II, which was the beginning of the UU Service Committee, and many, many more. And all of us, myself included, who have done the work of our faith and have failed either out of neglect or a sense that is somehow inappropriate or doesn't matter to connect our faith with our action. How many of us, when appropriate, share that we are you use, that the tenets of our faith, human dignity, interconnectedness, reason and conscience and justice and equity, loving the good, in, un, un, undergird the work we are doing out in mission to the world. How many of us, either as individuals or as a congregation, make conscious efforts not to be over and above or isolated and distant by plunging into interfaith conversations, plunging into dialogues with others, working with others that not only clarifies and deepens their understanding of us, but illuminates and deepens our understanding of them. In addition to fighting off the religious right, which we're really good at and need to do, and the religious wounds of the Bible Belt, are we really in there in the struggle with others in our faith community who are still swimming upstream? Are we with them as well? Are we? Here in Alabama, are there opportunities to carry on conversations in faith about our faith in the service of the greater world? Yes. Individually, yes. As an organized group, yes. As a hosting group, yes. As a working group in service to our communities, are we willing to name these dialogues as UU mission? I know, I imagine that we are already about this work. As Quilin Shin said, the time has come to go forth in church extension and missionary activity. If we have been reluctant in the past, let it not be so in the future. Other denominations not as able as ours have been missionaries, agents for their literature and superintendents to advise and cheer, organizing people, planting and fostering churches and doing good work. We must, we must do the same. Was not Shin's spirit his urge to give effective and impassioned voice to his faith? an example that might profit us all today. More to come.